Hey guys, or welcome back to the channel. I'm Spartan. And I'm Pudgy. And we are back with more Game of Thrones. Today we are reacting to the Season 1 Histories and Lore. You guys were recommending this in the comments and we thought it'd be fun, why not? I mean, we already know there's a lot of information that's left out from the books. We even saw that in Season 1, which a lot of lore in Season 1 could have been touched on a lot more. And without the help of you guys in the comments and people filling us in, we would have been in the dark and a lot more things. So we think this will be fun for us as well to be able to just better understand the world. Going into season two, we'll have a better grasp of everyone's sort of histories and stuff. Yeah, I'm actually excited to kind of get a backstory on a lot of things. Things that, you know, weren't really explained in the whole of season one. And things that we, we had questions on, but there was never light shed on it. But because of you guys in the comments, we did get that experience of like a more in-depth knowledge of the world. And this will just help even more. Now fear not. For anyone worrying about spoilers in either this or any of the future ones, we have mods and plenty of people in the community who are notifying us, you know, what we should and shouldn't watch for any spoilers for House of the Dragons or anything such. So if any of the future ones do contain spoilers, should we do them, we'll be aware. Now, this is our first time doing this. We don't even know if we'll enjoy it, but if we do enjoy it, we probably will do more of them. At the time of recording this, we haven't started season two yet. So we are watching this, just having finished season one with only... The knowledge of season one so it should be cool to fill us in on season one lore and prepare us for the upcoming seasons as well so i'm sure some of you notice i'm holding a pen i've got a pen and paper because i know this is going to be information overload so um don't mind me if you see me writing things down yeah and for me look i'll be honest that's a lot of effort i <laughs> I feel like I learn better by just being in the moment. And, and you've got a good memory. Generally, I've got a good memory. Many of you in the comments may disagree with things that I miss in watching the show, but generally I've got a very good memory for things. So I'll absorb more by just actually watching it and immersing in it. If I write down, I can't multitask for shit. So yeah. if I do that, it's game over. So that's where we're at. As always, guys, a huge thank you to everyone who supports us over on Patreon. It really helps the channel out a lot and allows us to keep producing content. If anyone's interested in supporting us on Patreon, check out the link in our description. We do have ad-free episodes, early access to upcoming reactions, and full-length uncut reactions, as well as other exclusive perks on our Patreon. So if you're interested in any of that, check that out. For everyone over on YouTube, if you enjoy the History and Law reaction and you want us to do more of these, smash that like button, get involved in the comments. Feel free to let us know what we may have missed or if we didn't understand anything properly. As long as it's spoiler free. Keep it spoiler free. <laughs> well, our mods are killing it anyway. And smash that subscribe button so you're up to date with all of our future uploads as soon as we start season two and beyond. Do want to give a quick shout out as well to our mod Wilson who hooked us up with the video, but to both our mods Wilson and Sardin as well, just for their amazing efforts in season one and for keeping us in the loop for what we should and shouldn't watch. As well as all you guys in the community that are constantly making us aware of things like this that we never would have known about to watch and to make our experience that much better. So big thank you to you all. In the dawn age of Westeros, before the coming of man and the raising of castles and cities, there were only the children of the forest. Little is known of them now, but it is said they were small in stature, dark and beautiful, and no taller than children when grown to manhood. They lived oh, wow. in the depths of the Dark forests elves? and hidden villages, crannogs and caves. They hunted with weirwood bows and armed themselves with blades of obsidian. Their wise men were called green seers and were possessed of a powerful magic. Mm. They worshipped nameless, faceless gods of the forest, stream and stone. Okay, are those the ones we see on the trees the maybe? It was they who carved faces yeah. in the great white trunks of the majestic weirwoods. Their deep-cut eyes were red with sap and ever watchful. Twelve thousand years ago, the first men came from the eastern continent, crossing a land bridge called the Arm of Dawn. Riding their great horses and wielding weapons of bronze, they cut down the children's forests and weirwoods. A terrible war raged between the children and the first Damn. men that lasted for centuries. At centuries? Last, the two races sought an end to the years of horror and bloodshed. They met on a small isle in the centre of a great lake called the God's Eye. God's Eye. We haven't seen that. It was there we? they forged the pact. The first men would be granted dominion over the coastland, the mountains, the high plains and the bogs. But the deep forest would forever belong to the children. And no weirwood tree would ever again fall to man's axe. To seal the pact before the gods, the children carved a face in every weirwood tree on the island. Yeah, we've definitely seen heaps of those. Isle of faces. But Damn. the pack could not withstand the coming of the Andals, a race of tall, fair-haired warriors. They attacked with fire and weapons of steel. 
slaughtering the children of the forest wherever they could find That's them. That's crazy. Burning out their weirwood groves, hacking away at the faces of the old gods, and spreading their own religion through the land. That new religion. followed, and the Andals conquered every kingdom in Westeros, save one, the North. Right. The kings of winter were able to withstand the Andal invasion, and descendants of the first men dwell there to this day. Is that a dire wolf, maybe? The old gods. As for the children of the forest, those who survived the slaughter were said to have fled far north and have not been seen again. Okay. Most have seen they're long dead, and some don't believe they ever existed. They live on only through song and legend, and in the okay. faces of the weirwood and trees. It's bleeding. You see the blood eyes that we see is like a bad omen. Yeah. Wow, that was actually interesting. So the Andals literally conquered everywhere but the north which is interesting because that's where ned's from now yeah correct but it's interesting to i mean it was funny because like we first saw those trees in house of the dragon and we had no idea we're like whose face is that why is it bleeding but yeah, i thought it was some curse or something at the beginning I mean, essentially it is, isn't it? Because, you know, when they're bleeding, it's we know now it's bad omen. Well, I wonder as well, the way it's said is almost like a myth, but it could have mm. happened, but didn't happen. It's a very interesting way that it's put forth. So I'm sort of half-half. I'm like, I think it probably happened, but is it also an old wife's tale to some degree? Has it been exaggerated over the years? You know, I, I don't know. Because it's also the children of the forest, like children in war for centuries slaughtered. That's, yeah, that's quite brutal. And Game of Thrones is a brutal universe, isn't it? I wonder if we'll see more reference to that in the future seasons, maybe even beyond the wall. Will we actually see some remnants of these children or anything? Who knows? When Aegon the Conqueror invaded Westeros, he had seven kingdoms to contend with. The kingdom of the north, the kingdom of the mountain and the vale, the iron island, the, vale. the kingdom of the rock, the kingdom yep. of the reach, the stormlands. So this is what we said at the beginning of House of the Dragon. These regions had been established by the first men thousands of years before, in the Age of Heroes. One hero age of heroes. in the fabled age was Bran the Builder. Bran raised the wall and built the stronghold of Winterfell, establishing House Stark and reigning as the first king in the north. Oh, oh, wow. Other legends tell of the Grey King in the Iron Islands. Grey King took a mermaid Ned's to Barber, maybe. and defeated Naga, the first sea dragon. Naga, sea Joy dragon. Pike, the current rulers of the region. Okay, the Greyjoys. Descend from him. House Casterly ruled the gold-rich Westerlands from their mighty seat of Casterly Rock. But their lands and power were swindled from them. Is that the, the hand's wife's? Land the Clever. Noble Place. house of Lan Castle Rock is from where the Lannisters are from. Oh, because it looked like it was on a cliffside. I thought it was where the Hand's wife was. No, staying. that's the Vale. Okay. But the Hand's wife is from House Tully. Okay. Lannister is said to have descended from him. The verdant and fertile okay. lands of the Reach were first ruled by House Gardener, whose founder, known as Garth Greenhand, wore a crown of flowers and vines. He ruled from Highgarden as the first king of the Reach and was said to have made the land bloom. Many noble houses trace their bloodlines back to him, including the current lords of Highgarden, House Tyrrell. In the Stormlands, according to Ballads of the Age, a warrior named Durin fell in love with Elenai, whose father was god of the sea and mother was goddess right. of the wind. She gave something. her maidenhead to him, committing herself to a mortal life. Enraged, her parents called upon the winds and waters, destroying Darren's bayside keep and wiping out his <laughs> wedding guests. That was cool. Darren like every Sydney princess the and rebuilt Disney his princess. keep, which was also destroyed. Four more castles he raised, each stronger than the last. All fell to the power of the gods. But Darren's seventh castle, Storm's End, withstood the gods' rage. Darren became known as Darren God's Grief. And reigned as the first Storm King. There are okay. countless other tales from the Age of Heroes, too many to count. I'm sure there These is. These histories weren't recorded in a book, but passed down from generation to generation. For old wives' tales. Song. And while some of them may be dismissed as fairy tales, every one of the Seven Kingdoms is defined by them. 
So it's actually interesting. So all those old wives tales from each kingdom kingdom is probably what their culture and their way of living is really embedded come from. In, yeah. yeah. So so you we're swaying more towards them being more wives tales in in a sense, yeah. Yeah. Because it almost seems a bit too far fetched, like it's mythological. But I wonder because the world also has a fantasy element to it. Yeah. I wonder how much of it real and. Honestly, this is a lot deeper than I was expecting it, kind of, but it's just really like... It is a lot to take in. I kind oh, of feel it's a like lot. I'm I'm going to back... be honest, guys. If I get 50% of this, I've done a good job because <laughs> this is something that I'll have to rewatch in my own yeah. time. Just take my time with it because it really requires a, it's a lot of information. It's like a whole other law and religion about it. Yeah. Now, this one is Valeria and the Dragons by Viserys Targaryen. So I wonder if it's the Viserys that we know from House of the Dragon or... Oh, King Viserys, or you mean this? I think well, he's number the one or number or three. Number th yeah. The third one's from Game of Thrones. Yeah. yeah. East of Westeros lies the smoking sea, where no ship dares sail. There are those who swear it to be demon haunted, and who's to say they're wrong? For it was there, thousands of years ago, that a cataclysmic event occurred, destroying one of the great civilizations in history. Damn. The so precise Viserys details from of their Game origins Thrones. are lost to us. But it is said the Valyrians were once a modest community of shepherds, tending their flocks on a small peninsula wow, of the so great different. eastern An continent. Eye. One fateful day, in a volcanic area known as the Fourteen Fires, they made a shattering discovery. Fourteen Fires? Dragons. Dragons oh. were found there. Scaled creatures with massive wings, sharp claws, and fiery breath. They were also said to have a deep-rooted connection to magic. Okay. In time, the Valyrians were able to tame the beasts. Harnessing God their immense hell. power, they established a city of wonder unlike any before. Or Both they're saying Valyrians or Targaryens. They became skilled at sorcery and metallurgy, creating uncommon weapons of spell forged steel. Wielding yeah, the Valyrian these weapons steel. astride their dragons, the Valyrians conquered the surrounding lands and slowly expanded west. At the time, the Giscari Empire dominated much of the Great Eastern Continent. Not tried anymore. tried to stop Valyria's expansion. The Giscari legions attacked the Valyrians five times, but could never defeat them. Yeah, no, we dragged Finally, it. the yeah, Valyrians dude, what marched are you on do? their capital, Old Gis, and obliterated it, turning its streets and buildings to ash with dragon flame, and wiping the Giscari people and their culture off the face of the earth. They had no chance. The freehold of Valyria, as it came to be known, became the most advanced civilization in the known world, with its own language, gods, and culture. The Valyrian's reach extended far and wide, covering Damn, most of the crazy. continent. Great cities were built and roadways paved, all of which led back to Valyria. The freehold would prosper for nearly 5,000 years. Shit, is that how long it was it before they... Last. An okay. event that became known only as the Doom laid mm. waste to the Valyrians, their capital city, and its surrounding lands. Wow. The peninsula itself was shattered, becoming what is now the Smoking Sea. Every dragon was thought to be lost, as were the Valyrians' spells, knowledge, and recorded history. And thus, the mighty empire collapsed. What caused this cataclysm? Yeah, no true. One knows for certain. Some say it was a volcanic eruption. Others say the Valyrians' own sorcery got the better of them. In any yeah. event, the doom's devastation of the Valyrian could be anything in this world. Who knows? Total, with the exception of a small rocky island in the narrow sea. Mm, Dragonstone. Dragonstone. So that's the last one, there, right? The Targaryens, the last of old Valyria, dwell. Yeah. Okay. They would That's lie they wait for another hundred years before unleashing the fury of the dragon on another continent, Westeros. Westeros. Right. That's cool. I I understand what why you got confused, but it it's not so much Valeria. It was like old Valeria um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the people within it, and there but was then, Valerian. But in House of the Dragon, the Valerians. Mm. They're not Targaryens. They're, no, but they're from old Valeria. True, and yeah. Targaryens are almost from the... They're just from Dragonstone. They're almost... Is that considered new Valeria, or what is that? Um, They're not just from Dragonstone. That was just the one that survived. Like, that one area that survived from old Valeria. But then what's the main differentiation between Targaryens and Valerians, then? Other than their physical features, but, like, how do you... From history-wise... Because um, it's saying here the Targaryens were 
living on Dragonstone, one of the last ones that survived, but I'm assuming Valerians must have survived as well from Valeria yeah. to have I, the two I branches. I think only a couple houses did. From what I remember of House of the Dragon, I feel like Kolos kind of mentioned that. Okay. Um, so Targaryens are basically a branch of Valeria. Yeah. 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 I, I know that. I'm just patching up some of the blanks. Yeah. Because we were sort of thrown into it in House of the Dragon, and now I'm getting a smoother, more holistic take on it all. Yeah. But it is interesting that... They, that's where they found the dragons, like, through that volcanic, I don't know, was it just the volcanoes? Or well, the 14 fires, it said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah interesting. You're sort of getting, you're almost imagining, like, what it would be like in that process, discovering new land and new beings to conquer, I guess. Yeah. And isn't it funny, like, they lost so much, they built up again to be, like, the one of the greatest conquerors. And, <laughs> and then- again. They're lost again. Yeah, they interesting bloodline. <laughs> I know. You know what I found interesting from that mini story? There were initially shepherds. Like, they were literally, like, from humble beginnings and whatnot. And then, so then dragons, conquerors and yeah. kingdom conquerors. And, like, it's such a different scale of living. I know. And, you know, it said that no one really knows what was the the reason of their downfall, but let's be fair. I mean, we saw it in House of the Dragon, literally civil war, like... The, you know, the, too the, much greed. When you get yeah. too greedy with power, you're going to create more enemies. There's a lot of goes on. Yeah, 100%. And it just even the greed within their four walls, like, is a lot in House of the Dragon, let alone, you know, worrying about other people. So, yeah, definitely would have contributed. So, this is the history of the Night's Watch. Okay, a bit more... By Commander Joer Mormon. Is he the one? He's um, Joris's Jorah's father. father. Yeah. Night gathers, and now my watch begins. It shall not end until That's the my oath. death. Yeah. I shall take no wife, hold no lands. Which is no crazy. Children. That commitment. It's almost like priesthood no commitment in a way. And win no glory. I shall live and die at my post. I am the sword in the darkness. I am the watcher on the walls. So they've literally just committed the to their death, essentially. Completely, yeah, to the cause. I pledge my life and honor to the night's watch for this night and all the nights to come. Legend Damn. tells of a winter that lasted a generation and of a vast and terrible darkness that fell across the land. It came to be known as the Long Night. In the midst of this darkness, the White Walkers emerged from the far north. Okay, so that's when they come out. With their armies of the dead, they waged war oh. against the living. That's so brutal. We've seen it in the intro scene. Remember the beheaded and everything. Leaving terror and destruction in their wake. No wonder why everyone's so scared of them. After years of brutal conflict and unbearable loss, an alliance of the first men and the children of the forest managed to drive the walkers and their minions back into the frigid northern wastelands from whence they came. Mm. To prevent another invasion, the first men erected the wall. Um, okay. The wall was fortification, 700 feet in height, wow. stretching um. from the Frostfang Mountains in the west to the Bay of Seals in the east. That's like it's all it was the way a structure through. unlike any ever built. Yeah, Indeed, I can imagine. Some maintain it could only have been completed with the aid of giants or using the powerful magic of the ancient children of the forest. Interesting. It's true. How the hell was it to guard like? and maintain it? And thus the Night's Watch was born. A sworn brotherhood tasked with defending the realms of men against the dark forces that lay beyond. Upon taking his vows, a brother of the Night's Watch serves for life. It is a life of hardship and great sacrifice. Yeah, of course. So the must not be taken lightly. The punishment for desertion is death. Which we know all too well. The Night's Watch is divided into three vital branches. Oh, okay. The Rangers. We knew that, yeah. The Builders and the Stewards. Hmm. While Poor John Snow. All black brothers are expected to take up steel should the need arise, the rangers are the true warriors of the watch. Centuries come and gone, 
And although the White Walkers have yet to return, another threat has emerged. Barbarian tribes known as wildlings. Mm, oh, girl. Yeah, yeah. Are charged with defending the realm against these lawless savages. The builders are carpenters, masons, miners, and woodsmen, tasked with maintaining the wall, as well as its various keeps, towers, and structures, which have fallen into disrepair over the years. The stewards serve as cooks, butchers, and hunters. They tend to the horses and messenger ravens, sew clothing, gather firewood, and bring supplies up from the south. The Night's Watch is a diverse group. Proud volunteers from noble houses stand side Proud by volunteers. side with pity <laughs> Maybe originally. scripted from dungeons. Class distinctions are left behind, as are past misdeeds. A man gets what he earns on the wall. And I like that. It's like a clean slate there, you know. Can rise up in rank if he proves himself. You're not judged on your past. For thousands or just for being of years, born in a certain the family. brothers of the Night's Watch have stood their lonely vigil. As the seasons changed, as brutal wars raged in the south, as dynasties rose and fell, the Night's Watch endured. It is a very different world, isn't we, it? Compared to all the kingdoms the and the politics there. The darkness. They're their own little entity. We are the watchers on the wall. We are the shields that guard the realms of men. Damn. That's so crazy because Joa Mormon, his view of it is so like honorable and proud of the Night's Watch and it's very factual and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, Master Lewin's rendition Maester, of the Night Watch. Yeah. Oh, Maester, Maester Lewin, yeah. What his rendition of the Night's Watch is going to be. Which one's Maester Lewin again? I'm trying to remember. I think he's that really old I one. thought so. So he's, because if it is, then he's the uh, Targaryen. I think he might be the other one. Honestly, sorry guys, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm going to look it up real quick. May as well. May as well know what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. Too many characters in this show, dude, I can't keep up. Yeah, he's the yeah, old guy. Yeah, he is the old one. Correct. Interesting. Joining the Night's Watch or taking the Black is a singular honour for any northerner. For it was in the north, some 8,000 years ago, that the first man drove back the White Walkers, erected the wall, and established the sworn brotherhood that would guard the realm and its people from the dangers beyond. Regrettably, the Night's Watch no longer commands the widespread respect and admiration it once did. Yeah. While House yeah. Stark and other houses in the northern regions continue to recognize its vital importance to the safety and stability of the realm, this view is not shared by the powerful houses of the southern kingdoms oh, wow. or their subjects. Most regard the Watch as a misguided, obsolete order made up All of useless right. outcasts. A thing of the past, yeah, it's true, we've seen that. The Which I get. Night's Watch is a shadow of its former glory. And we've all seen that too. The numbers have dwindled to less than a thousand. Of the 19 castles along the wall, only three are functional. The Shadow Tower, Castle Damn. Black, and East Watch by the Sea. Castle Black is where John Snow is. And the Watch's is. mandate of adding to the wall has been we abandoned the other two? entirely. No. There are barely enough resources to maintain it. Recruiting officers, known as Wandering Crows, scour the dungeons and slums of the realm in hope of finding men to fill the ranks. Hmm. While there is still the occasional highborn volunteer, the newest recruits are almost entirely made up of lowly criminals. Thieves, rapists and murderers, sentenced to the wall as punishment for their crimes. Yeah, That's right. Shit. So Snow would have been a price the catch. The decline of this yeah. once fabled order is troubling, as the danger it guards against is all too real. While the White Walkers haven't been seen or heard from in ages, and may very well be the stuff of myth, until now. Barbarian tribes that dwell beyond the wall, yeah. known as wildlings, have been a menace to the North and its people for generations. At certain points in history, the disparate wildling tribes have united behind a single leader, a king beyond the wall, and that attempted pretty cool. scale attacks against the realm. King beyond the wall. But thanks to the resourceful and courageous men of the Night's Watch, these so-called kings were soundly defeated. While many have lost faith in the Night's Watch, 
The people of the North are steadfast in their belief that the Black Brothers will answer the call of duty. But with winter coming, diminished numbers, and a lack of widespread support, will they be ready? And it's definitely it's coming. Question. It's a good question. You know what's crazy? They don't have enough resources, but mate, what we've seen in the first season of Game of Thrones, they're going to need those resources. Winter is definitely coming. And people just don't believe it. I mean... Understandably, if it's been yeah. a thousand years or whatever since you... you even your great-grandfather wouldn't have seen yeah. anything. It's like, a, it's probably an old wife's tale, you know? Which I get, yeah, exactly. Like what we were saying about a lot of the earlier stuff. So the wildlings live beyond the wall as well, but then how do the ones we see cross over? Isn't the wall... Does it not block everything completely? I mean, I would assume that they can still go around. Like, it's not I saw completely... on the map the little mountains, but I wasn't sure if there's gaps between the mountains or if it's proper mountain ruggedry. Who knows? Because it sounds yeah. like they live on the other side of the wall, but they somehow made it to the north as well. Yeah, well, but I don't know. Like, it would make sense that there is still somewhat the ability to go through. I mean, they did say that guarding it hasn't been... You know, they don't have enough people to guard it completely. So I'm sure there are things that are going to slip through, you know. There's only three houses of how many. And even then, they've still got dwindling numbers. So, yeah, it does make sense. Okay, so this is from Tywin Lannister's point of view. We haven't heard much from him in season one. Only dribs and drabs. So it'll be interesting to hear from him now. Long ago in the wintry north, an army of demons emerged from beneath the icy ground and spread darkness and despair across the land. Astride their monstrous spiders, flanked by giants, they wreaked havoc on the innocent, slaughtering thousands. All hope was lost until the fearless warriors of the first Night's Watch drove them back into the wintry mountains and built a magic wall to keep them from ever invading again. These stalwart brothers in black continue to protect us even to this day from the evils that lurk in the so getting so many different takes on the yeah on the An wall. absurd lie a fairy tale spun by many a wet nurse yeah. in the north this is the more cynical take short, on it a giant wall does exist the triumph of engineering perhaps but not of <laughs> magic ah, as for the night's watch there may have been a time centuries ago when there was prestige and honor in the miserable monastic life of a black brother. But now, the wall has become a glorified penal colony, full of outcasts, criminals, and assorted ne'er-do-wells. Which is kind of true. Today, after. a typical man of the Night's Watch most likely started out a lowly beggar, or a rapist, or a village idiot. <laughs> As for the few high-born watchmen, they either fought on the losing side of a war, Oh. Or were disowned by their parents for one reason or another. So sad. Those who Damn. persist in defending the Night's Watch will claim the Seven Kingdoms need protection from the wildling tribes of the far north. And what do you but think? There's little to fear from those primitives. They're a nuisance, but not sophisticated or powerful enough to be a significant threat to the realm. Don't and underestimate any talk people, of white you know. Walkers returning with their armies of the dead and their giant spiders. And their snarks is just I look that. forward to seeing those in cool. upcoming seasons. Very cynical take on that. Pretty much what we expected, to be honest. Not surprised there. The, initially, how he was speaking, it almost sounded like a little bit of admiration. Then he went straight cynical. Okay, the old gods and the new. By Bran and Caitlin. Yeah. In the seven kingdoms of Westeros, the dominant religion is the faith of the seven first brought to its shores by the Andal some 6,000 years ago. But there are some who still keep to the old way, worshipping the faceless and gods that the children the of the forest yeah. and the first men. The old gods are countless, nameless spirits of nature. In ancient times, the children of the forest carved faces in the trunks of the weirwood trees, which became sacred symbols of their faith. In time, first men adopted the children's gods as their own. Most castles at that time contained a godswood with a weirwood or heart tree at its centre. Meanwhile, yeah, not across so much. the narrow sea, a new religion was born in the hills of Andalos. Okay, According yeah. to legend, the god of seven <clears throat> revealed itself to the Andals, 
and the invasion of Westeros followed soon after. The Andals sailed across the sea on ships armed with weapons of steel. Some warriors carved a seven-pointed star into their skin as a symbol of their new faith. The invaders destroyed most of the we saw in the with that. Land, slaughtered the children of the forest wherever they could find them, and conquered every kingdom of the first men, save the north. In time, the faith of the seven spread like wildfire throughout the land. The seven is a single deity with seven aspects, each symbolizing a different area of life, though most people refer to the seven as separate gods. The mother is prayed to for mercy and watches over fertility, child. So that's probably why they have seven kingdoms, right? The father Each one dedicated sits to a god, maybe. judgment over souls. The warrior is prayed to for protection, valor, and skill in battle. The crone is the symbol of wisdom and foresight. Wisdom. The smith watches Scary. over creation and craftsmanship. The maiden symbolizes purity, love, and beauty. Finally, there is the stranger, rarely prayed to, who represents stranger. death. Death. The faith is highly organized and deeply influential in Westerosi politics and culture as the official religion of the monarchy. Worshippers gather in temples of the faith called septs. The seat of the faith is the great sept of Baelor, which is located in the capital city of King's oh, Landing. Oh, that's where Ned died. Still, in the north, Don't remind me. where descendants of the first men dwell, worship of the old gods continues to this day. And the sacred faces of the weirwood trees keep close watch over the faithful. So poor Ned not only was killed in a place where it's not even his faith. Like, <laughs> that's so sad. Yeah, there was no honour in our death at all. No honour at all. You'd think, like, you know, okay, maybe his religion, like, that would be incorporated somehow, you know, at one of those weirwood trees. No. No. But, yeah, we did see Alicent with the seven-point star, and that's how she redecorated the castle, which is a big thing, especially the Targaryens. They were the old gods. Yeah, so we also have a bit of extra insight because we've watched the prequel by the time we're watching this. Yeah. Compared to most of you probably who, you know, have watched this a lot earlier. The Field of Fire by Rob Stark. Get to hear Rob's voice Here now. Here we go, Rob. The ascension of Aegon Targaryen was confirmed and the fate of the Seven Kingdoms sealed. I'm most interested in this lore because I know most about Kings it. Kings Lauren Lannister of the Rock and Myrne Gardner of the Reach stood against Aegon's invasion. They commanded wow. a united force of 600 banners. 5,000 mounted knights and 50,000 men at arms. Wow. Aegon's host was vastly outnumbered, and when the army of the two kings charged, the invaders turned heel and ran. Oh, and wow. That was no match for dragon flame. Yeah. yeah. When Aegon was gonna say. all three of his dragons, 4,000 souls were horrendous. So he controlled three of his own, field, like Lord Daenerys does. Interesting. Realizing all hope was lost, King Lauren surrendered. The Starks of Winterfell had no intention of submitting to Targaryen rule. <laughs> no, they didn't. They had reigned as kings in the north since the days of the first men and were determined oh, to resist they had been kings in the north before. Just as they had resisted the Andals thousands of years before. King Torrhen Stark led his army to the Red Fork just east of Riverrun, hoping to succeed where Lorne and Myrne had failed. But when Torrhen saw the size of Aegon's now mighty host, along with his monstrous dragons, yeah. He knew he couldn't subject his followers to the horror of another field of fire. He bent the knee and swore fealty to Aegon, who allowed the Starks to maintain their lordship over the region as Lords Paramount and Wardens of the North. Without question, at least they got that. Aegon Stark saved yep. thousands of lives that day. Good leader. He was ever after known as the king who knelt. Interesting. It's actually interesting that. You know, it seems to be a trait of the Starks. They really care about their people, not just their own... Their honourable leaders. Yeah. So King of the North, which Rob was named by the end of season one, has more meaning now because they were originally Kings of the North. I think they just lost that title once the Targaryens came into rule. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Rob did say that, you know, he was... 
like Ned was the person that was managing the North yeah, for but him, the but it was still under King his just rule. Now has more more merit to it. Yeah. All right. Let's hear from Viserys' point of view about this, from a Targaryen point of view. The days of the one Andals sure. were numbered. One by one, their so-called kings were bending the knee or facing the wrath of Aegon Targaryen. That'd be so scary. Aegon of old Valyria. Aegon who was blood of the dragon. After defeating the Iron Man at Harrenhal and slaying the last of the Storm Kings, Aegon and his sisters, Rhaenys and Visenya, set their sights on other prizes. The gold mines of the rock and the fertile lands of the Reach. Mm. King Lauren Lannister of the Rock and King Mern Gardener of the Reach foolishly thought their combined armies could beat back the Targaryen host. Definitely not. They not with dragons. Together, their proud banners flapping in the wind and faced off against Aegon in a vast golden field of wheat. Imagine the confidence. The two kings commanded a massive force of nearly 60,000 and it appeared the day was theirs until Aegon unleashed all three of his dragons for the first and only time. Oh, Each only time. All three of them at the same the time. the Valyrian gods of Aegon's forefathers. Visenya rode Vhagar. Vhagar. His fiery breath could melt So armor. we know Vhagar from House of the Dragon. Venus rode Meraxes. Meraxes. Whose jaws were big enough to swallow a horse whole. Oh, wow. Greatest of all was Beleriand the Black Dread. With fire dark as night and wings so huge, whole towns were covered in shadow when he flew Shit. overhead. Shit! <gasps> that man, was Aegon's. Wow. Was written by Aegon himself. Of course it was. Four thousand men were bathed in glorious dragon flame that day, on what Damn. came to be known as the Field of Fire. The dragons were way King superior. Was among the dead, and House Gardener died with him. His stewards, the Tyrells surrendered his ancestral stronghold of High Garden to Aegon and were appointed Lords Paramount of the Reach and Wardens of the South. When Lauren Lannister witnessed Mern's fate, he wisely bent the knee. Yeah. Aegon spared wisely. Lauren's life, and the Lannisters were made Lords do? Paramount of the Westerlands and Wardens of the West. After his triumph on the Field of Fire, Aegon's conquest was assured. In a short time, the so-called Seven Kingdoms were melted down in the heat of the dragon's flame and transformed into a single realm. Yeah. Aegon would forever be known as Aegon the Conqueror. The Conqueror. I love how it goes, the so-called Seven Kingdoms. Like, just like the arrogance in the way he presents the story is so funny. It's such a Viserys way of telling the story. Yeah, it's very different hearing it. When you see it from that point of view, it seems almost like a brutal conquering. I mean, he's called the Conqueror, but from the House of the Dragons point of view, it seemed almost like... Glorified. Yeah, but also like the saving of his people kind of mm. thing and charting to new land. So you sort of seeing the other side of it uh, is interesting as well. Yeah, but it's interesting that he only used the three dragons that one time. And I mean, so I like that though. Yeah, but that's the point I wanted to make that Daenerys now has three dragons. We haven't seen mm -hmm. any of that in House of the Dragon, so maybe that's just how special she is. She's the first in, since Aegon to be able to command three dragons at once. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see. Hopefully we didn't know that season. before. Yeah. Okay, The Order of the Maces by Maester Lewin. Maester Lewin again. In the far southwest of Westeros, at the mouth of the river Honeywine, lies the great stone city of Old Town. It is home to the Citadel, where men and boys from throughout the kingdoms come to receive their training as maesters. Okay. Maesters play an integral role in Westerosi society, serving as scholars, healers, and advisors to the nobility of the Seven Kingdoms. This venerable order of learned men dedicate their lives to serving the realm and are sworn to occupy a neutral position when it comes to power and politics. Upon completing his training at the Citadel and taking his vows, a maester renounces his family name and takes a vow of celibacy. All right. Wow, He's everyone's celibate. That's why it's called Maester Lewin. And duty bound to serve as its counselor and healer, even if control of the castle changes hands. A maester's allegiance is to the realm, not to any one family. His like badge of office Varys. is a great chain 
forged from links of different metals which he wears around his neck. It is a reminder of his role as a servant of the realm and is never to be removed. Oh. The master forges his chain right. to study, and each link represents the mastery of a different kind of learning. For instance, a silver link signifies mastery of the medicinal arts. Okay. A golden link represents the study of money and accounting. Never noticed that. An iron link yeah, well, indicates Gaffer. knowledge of warcraft. Ravenry is an especially important skill for a maester, as it is he who breeds, trains, and maintains carrier ravens for the delivering of messages throughout the land. We know how important that is. Who have earned a link forged of Valyrian steel. This signifies knowledge of the higher mysteries, commonly known as magic. Only one maester in a hundred possesses such a link. Oh wow! This field of study is frowned upon by many in the order. It is possible magic may have existed for a time long ago, but most consider the higher mysteries to be long gone from this world. Yes. Service as a maester is a noble calling, one of vital importance to a prosperous realm. It is little wonder there are some who refer to the order as the Knights of the Mind. I will just say, guys, this is so law heavy. I know my reaction is probably subpar. Just <laughs> keeping up with it is so much. Like, it's a lot denser than I expected it to be. So, yeah, I'm trying to almost keep up. So, I'll react where I can, but I, I know that I'm probably very much in tune with all the law that's being thrown at us right now yeah you're just trying to like focus make sure you're absorbing everything yeah but that is interesting so the maces are almost like the necks of the realm whereas the kings are the head so the maces like in their own field can kind of guide the king from their expertise and things like that whereas the king is like the final and they say. connect the head to the body i assume the body is like the people so yeah true true it's a good way of looking at it but that's exactly what v Lord Varus said. Um, I serve the realm, yeah. Yeah, I serve the realm. So Mad King Ares by Maester Lua. This would be good to hear more. Probably most relevant to more recent times is yeah. to hear about his reign. As word of King Ares' erratic and troubling behaviour spread throughout the Seven Kingdoms, Lord Rickard Stark continued to serve his king faithfully as Warden of the North. Ned's father. The father of four children, his daughter and Iona, was engaged to Robert Baratheon, the young lord of Storm's End. Poor Rob. Storm's End? Of peace oh. between the North and the Iron Throne ended the day Rhaegar Targaryen, Prince of Dragostone, abducted Lyanna. Enraged, Brandon Stark rode to King's Landing, demanding the release of his sister and the death of Rhaegar. Oh, damn. Ares <laughs> arrested him for treason. And called his father to come to the capital to ransom him. How's that treason? When Lord Rickard complied, Ares now utterly mad, arrested him for treason as well. Damn, dude. Lord Rickard and he did nothing. a trial by combat. Ares declared fire the champion Far of the Targaryen and had Lord Rickard suspended no from honor the, at all. the throne room while pyromancers lit a blaze beneath him. As he burned, Brandon was brought into the throne room. A leather cord attached up. to a strangulation device was wrapped around his neck. Far out. That's a brutal story. His father was a dead man, but there was a chance to save him. A long sword was placed on the floor just out of Brandon's reach. And the more he struggled to reach it, the more the cord tightened around his Damn, throat. Dude, that's, that's, that's a horror Brandon story. Stark strangled himself trying to free his father. That's so sadistic. in his own armor. The entire court stood and watched this atrocity take place. Sir Jaime Lannister and the King's Guard among them. The Mad King was reported to have laughed hysterically as these two Far out, men dude. were tortured and brutally killed before him. Noble man, for sure. Seeking to rid the world of all his supposed enemies, Ares called for the head of Rickard's younger son, Eddard Stark, nee. and Leona's betrothed, Robert Baratheon. He sent word to Lord John Arryn, who had fostered both young men at the Eyrie, to apprehend them. Oh, Instead, the hand. Lord Arryn joined houses Stark and Baratheon in rebellion. Robert vowed to kill Rhaegar Targaryen and get his beloved Leona back.
Damn, I didn't know about that end bit. I think someone explained it to us, but that is brutal. And it gives him more respect to the hands. Like, he was actually a, a good hand. Yeah. And even more tragic that he died. We don't know how yet. We suspect poison, but that he died by the Lannisters, particularly Cersei, who only even had her position because of Robert's Rebellion, not hers, you know? Damn, that is crazy. But he wanted Rob's head too. Like this guy's just just wants heads left, right, and center. Like well, he knew it? someone will seek vengeance, so kill the enemies. It makes sense from his point of view, but it's still crazy. Yeah, crazy. So this is Mad King Aries from Robert's point of view. Interesting. It's gonna be a sad story. Aerys Targaryen was the last of his name to sit on the Iron Throne. Miss his voice. far and wide as the Mad King. His was a reign of instability and terror. Oh, you the can say that again. The are well rid of him and his kind. Oh, he may have appeared to be a capable ruler at first, but that was due in no small part to his counsellors, led by the hand of the king, Tywin Lannister. Oh, he was the hand. There were years of peace and prosperity during Eris's reign. But it was Tywin who was really running the country as Eris spiraled further and further into insanity. Interesting. The dragon right. spawn were famous for losing their minds. Oh. It was the price they paid for really? centuries of keeping the bloodlines pure. And oh, Eris for the incest, more than maybe. happily continued the noble sister-fucking tradition of his forefathers. <laughs> as the years Rob. passed, Eris's behavior became increasingly erratic. He cut himself so often on his Iron Throne, many referred to him as King Scab, though never to his face. No, it you was don't want to. He developed an obsession with wildfire, and was known to inflict horrific punishments on those he considered enemies, including Damn. burning them alive. As his paranoia and bloodlust grew, he had a bitter falling out with Lord Tywin, who had served the crown faithfully for twenty years. 20 years, At least damn. Tywin was able to leave the job with his life and fortunes intact. Right. Subsequent How lucky. Subsequent hands of King Aris weren't so fortunate. Shit. Then the Targaryens went too far. The Crown Prince Rhaegar abducted Lyanna Stark, daughter of Rickard Stark, the Lord of Winterfell. That's where his line she was. She was my betrothed. She was my beloved. Aww. Beautiful and spirited. It's always woman. his biggest regret. And I loved her more than life itself. Rhaegar went south with Lyanna, hiding her away in dawn. What harm he inflicted on the poor girl, the gods only know. Yeah, true. Brandon Stark, Lyanna's eldest brother, was outraged. He rode to King's Landing to confront the king and demand his sister's safe return. Instead, Eris had him executed, his father, Rickard Stark, as well. There wasn't much left to discuss after that. Eris feared their loved ones would seek revenge for what he did. Bloody he hell. was right to be afraid. <laughs> yes, Eris Rob. wasted no time in calling for the heads of Brandon's younger brother, my friend, Eddard Stark. And my head, too, of course. I'm sorry he didn't come looking for it himself. <laughs> Alongside John Aaron of the Vale, the man who fostered Ned and I as children, Baratheons, Starks, and Tullys all called their banners. Once our rebellion began, the Mad King's days were numbered. And thank goodness for that. Could you imagine? I know. I love the confidence by Robert. I do miss him. Damn. Yeah. Him and Ned. Two great characters taken from us way too soon. I know. Introduce us to the brutality of Game of Thrones for sure. We lost some big characters oh, for in sure. season one. But it's interesting. Uh, that kind of reminded me of, you know, Rob said he, uh, Tywin was the hand for 20 years and he did nothing with the name. But Tywin was literally saying to Jamie, oh, all you've done is served so many kings. It's like, what do you mean? So did you. Like, you just, for 20 years, you were a hand. And his mind probably thinks he did more. Yeah. He thought like, oh, he's gone crazy. I'm actually ruling the kingdom. Yeah, it's fathers and sons. Yeah. Classic. All right, Mad King Aerys by Tywin. Okay, so his point of view will be interesting because he's sort of uh, been on both sides of the coin. So 
As Ares Targaryen's behavior grew more and more erratic, the task of ruling the Seven Kingdoms fell to me, Tywin Lannister. Mm. I had served Ares for nearly 20 years, and as a result, the realm had prospered. The royal coffers were full, the land was at peace. But Ares grew increasingly hostile, jealous of the success many credited to me. Oh, okay, so people my actually power knew. And influence yeah. unnerved him. The captain of my personal guard, Sir Ellen Payne, was once overheard making offhand comments regarding who was the true ruler of Westeros. <laughs> when the king was given this information, he had Ellen Payne's tongue ripped out with hot pincers. Shit. It was my desire to unite the houses of Lannister and Targaryen through marriage. My daughter Cersei would marry Aerys' eldest son, Prince Rhaegar. Right. Such a union made perfect sense for all parties. However, imagine how crazy Aerys she would have been then. had begun to leave him quite some time earlier. Instead of uniting the royal family with its most loyal and powerful ally, Ares chose instead to insult my family, indicating that such a match was beneath Rhaegar. Right. Instead, he chose Elia Martell of Dorne to be Rhaegar's wife. As if to rub salt in my wounds, Ares appointed Jamie, my son, to the King's Guard. The King's Guard may be an honor for lesser families than ours. But it is a lifetime appointment that forces him to renounce all family holdings. Oh, yeah, yeah. true. Right. This creates a difficulty in naming an heir to Casterly Rock. Right. But Ares knew all that. I had grown tired of the king's constant provocation. Thus, I resigned my post as Ares' hand and returned to Casterly Rock with my considerable forces. When Robert Baratheon rebelled against the throne, Ares grew fearful that I would join with Robert's forces and rise against him. <laughs> Good. He thought himself clever and kept Jamie very close, as if warning me. He <laughs> sunk deeper and deeper into delusion, paranoia, and violence. I've heard it said he became obsessed with wildfire. A substance which, once lit, cannot be extinguished. Oh! Wow. Convinced he had enemies all around him, he wouldn't allow blades in his presence, save for those of his king's guard. Alas, that proved to be his undoing. <laughs> yes, Jamie. Nice. Well, I am thankful that Jamie actually did stab him in the back, so well done to Jamie for that. 100%. House Targaryen by Viserys. Viserys, the thing is, he doesn't really know shit. He's just what he was told. He was very young when he left the kingdom. Yeah. It is interesting. Not, I almost wish they did a prequel series on the Mad King Ares and Rob and Ed and Ned younger to see the yeah. whole thing. That'd be pretty cool. That would be cool, actually. The Targaryen dynasty united the Seven Kingdoms and lasted nearly three centuries. It was a dynasty forged in fire, sealed in blood and destroyed by rebellion. The Targaryens are blood of the dragon, descended from the nobility of ancient Valyria, a once mighty empire in the east. When the cataclysmic doom laid waste to Valyria and its people, the Targaryens survived, having settled on the island fortress of Dragonstone years before. They remained Very there for decision. a century, until the rise of Aegon the Conqueror. Instead of attempting to reclaim the eastern lands of his ancestors, Aegon sailed west for the Seven Kingdoms. <laughs> his sisters the confidence, and honestly. Rhaenys at his side. To keep the bloodlines pure, Aegon continued the custom of his Valyrian ancestors and took both of his sisters to wife. Both! How greedy. Together, <laughs> they came dude. ashore on the eastern coast of Westeros. Their blazing a dragon with three heads representing Aegon and his sister wives. Their words, fire and blood. While their host was Very small in words. comparison to the armies of Westeros that awaited them, Aegon and his sisters had a secret weapon, the last of the dragons. He conquered every kingdom save Dawn, which eventually bowed to Targaryen rule a century later. He had the swords of his enemies melted down by the fiery breath of his dragon, Beleriand the Black Dread, 
And the make that badass go around. The capital city of King's Landing looks even better in House on the Dragon. Eastern coast, where Aegon and his sisters first came ashore. And Aegon ordered the construction of a royal castle on its highest hill, the Red Keep. For 300 years, the Targaryen dynasty stayed strong in the face of rebellion, civil war, and plague. That's a decent time, to be but fair. the line of Dragon Kings was broken when my father, Ares Targaryen, the second of his name, was overthrown in rebellion. Yeah. My father was betrayed and slaughtered by Sir Jaime Lannister, a member of his <laughs> own King's Guard. His son and heir, my brother Rhaegar, perished on the field yep. of battle yep. at the hands of Robert Baratheon, who claimed the Iron Throne for himself. And so today, the only surviving members of the storied Targaryen dynasty are myself, Prince Viserys, rightful King of the Andals and ruler <laughs> of the Seven Kingdoms. It's not just myself. And my sister, Daenerys. We were spirited away to the free cities of the East by loyalists. Here we have lived in exile ever since. Dreaming of a day when we will cross the narrow sea and take back my father's throne. Yeah, that right. day will never come for you. <laughs> yeah, not for him. I mean, he'll get his uh, golden crown. Oh, yeah, he already got that, didn't he? But it's actually interesting. So he didn't even know about Mesa Lewin being Targaryen. He just thinks it's him and his sister. Yeah, I want to find out more about his connection and what did the king know about him or because he's older than the king so is he a bastard child like hmm. i don't know what's the because th there's no mention of his connection like the mad king there's no mention of them ever being together like him knowing him or, yeah uh well, and his children so actually his children were killed by tywin so they did know him they did know him i just haven't seen the connection between him and the king like yeah they haven't mentioned it in the stories and things like that but so he said that he was meant to be the ruler but he denied it so they haven't really mentioned that that was just his story like when he was explaining it to Jon snow but yeah i'm pretty sure he was Aerys' brother that's right yeah, yeah, yeah it's hard to remember everything but Okay, so he's brother to the Mad King. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And that's why he right. was next in line or something, I think. But he denied taking the throne. So yeah, Fair enough. That's Seems right. like such a gentle man, but he's brother to a psycho. I know. I know. All right, Robert's Rebellion by the man himself. This is going to be a great story. Rebellion. <laughs> the crimes of House Targaryen were too heinous to go unanswered. The noble houses of Baratheon, Stark, and Arryn united to oppose and overthrow the line of the cursed Dragon Kings. While Ned Stark and Arryn secured an alliance with the Tullys of Riverrun, I called the banners of Storm's End and rode out in force against the Mad King and his minions. <laughs> Gods, those were some battles. He loves it. Our first victory occurred at Summerhall, where I faced off against an army of dragon loyalists and won three battles in a single day. Wow. And that's day. him in his prime shape. Seven Hells, that was a glorious day. <laughs> I love when he says Seven Hells. We tried to take Ashford Castle in the Reach, but the Tyrrells beat us back. We had to regroup. My army was pursued north by Eris's army and took refuge in the Stony Sept in the river. Yeah, so much pride in his army, you can tell. When the Targaryen army entered the town, the Sept bells tolled, a signal to the townspeople of the battle that was to come. As the Targaryens searched from house to house for me, the combined forces of Ned Stark and the Tullys swept into the city. Damn, God, that would have been a great battle to win us. I would have liked to win this that battle. It's now known as the Battle of the Bells. Battle of the Bells. We overwhelmed the Mad King's forces and sent them scampering back to King's Landing. Yeah, you did. Eris' son, Rhaegar, who started the whole damn thing, finally <laughs> emerged from hiding in the south and assembled his Coward. own army to face us. As for the Mad King... He must have been pissing himself. <laughs> the battle that would decide the fate of the Seven Kingdoms occurred at the crossing of the Green Fork of the Trident River. Where Rob was trying to cross. commanded the royal host, which was some 40,000 strong. My forces were outnumbered by nearly 5,000 men. Damn. But that didn't matter. <laughs> they were fresh, 
that we were battle-hardened and had mm. justice on our side. As the battle raged around us, I faced off with Rhaegar, the stag oh, yeah, and the dragon right there in the ford of the river. I fought with the fury of ten men, raining blow after blow upon that vile prince, of course you did. Or burying my warhammer in his chest. I hit him so hard, the rubies on his armor broke free, flinging them into the stream. They call it the Ruby Ford. Now. Fire. And that armor's hard to break, With that we were scum, told. Rhaegar dead and the royal army shattered. Our next move was to make for King's Landing. But I'd sustained a few wounds in the battle and was unable to ride. Oh, I damn. sent Ned Stark to the capital to face the Mad King and make him pay for his crimes. Right, so Ned delivered the final blow. And that's why I think they said that Ned could have claimed to be king, but he didn't want it, so yeah. he had to rob. Wish he had taken her though and just had Cersei and uh, Joffrey burnt at the stake. Oh, I know. Do you know how different this story would have Should been? Should have let Joffrey been born and then just behead him. <laughs> oh, but I just wish that... I don't know whether it'd be good or not, but I just wish that Rob knew that Joffrey wasn't his son, you know? See, if we were... Yeah, if Rob was there, then it was going to be okay, you know, it's a shame. All right, Robert's Rebellion by Viserys, so now we're going to hear the more cynical side of it. Here we go. The Targaryens, blood of the dragon, and the last of old Valyria, were loved by their subjects <laughs> and admired far and wide as the greatest dynasty in the history of the Western world. Maybe at world. one point, yeah, but definitely not towards but the, the end. the peace and prosperity of nearly three centuries of Targaryen rule was shattered by the usurper, Robert Baratheon. And his band of traitors. I mean, I do get that perspective. But... Owed its very and he would have been just a kid the at the time. Was it not Aegon the Dragon himself who elevated the bastard Oris Baratheon in the War of Conquest? And what of the Starks, the Lannisters, the Aerons of the Vale? All had been stuck and allowed to keep their lands when Aegon could easily have wiped them out. Centuries later, the usurper and his lackeys repaid Aegon's benevolence with treachery. There are some who dare to claim Robert and his allies had reason to rebel. They say the dare crown prince stole the usurper's lady <laughs> love. Yeah. They say my father, King Ares, murdered Rickard Stark and his son without just cause. Whether these charges are true or not, it doesn't matter. The dragon answers to no one. Wow. Ares' good name has been besmirched in the years. He would have been another terrible king. He's been called a dangerous madman, a monster, a tyrant that brought his tragic end upon himself. Which is true. Yes. <laughs> My father was a victim of weaklings in his council, <laughs> lackwits who failed him in his hour of need and let the rebellion spin out of control. But it was not enough. The royal army was crushed at the Battle of the Trident. It was there the valiant Rhaegar met Robert in single combat, but the gods betrayed him. Valiant Rhaegar. And he perished by the usurper's hand. As the field of fire had marked the end of the Andal centuries before, the Battle of the Trident seemed to herald the end of the Dragon Kings. When word reached the capital of my brother Rhaegar's death, my father Ares moved to protect me as I was the surviving heir to the throne. Oh, he sent right. me to the island fortress of Dragonstone, along with my mother, Queen Rayla, who was great with child. But as Daenerys. my father, my king, Ares Targaryen, prepared to defend his throne to the bitter end, little did he know of the horrors and betrayals that awaited him and our family. Yeah, right. I mean, look, like, I do get his perspective, especially being a kid and things yeah. like that, but look, your dad was a crazy man. He yeah. didn't get that nickname for no reason. So I'm gathering that they, they didn't have dragons controlled by this point. They'd already lost no. them by that point. Yeah, so that's, well, that's why they could usurp them. Yeah, well, Viserys said, like, he's never seen a dragon before. Yeah. Yeah. So House Baratheon. Okay, a bit more about the House Baratheon. Ours is the fury. These are the words of the Black Stag of Baratheon. A battle cry echoed throughout the land in rebellion when I, Robert Baratheon, the first of his name, seized the Iron Throne from the Mad King, Eris Targaryen, <laughs> ending a dynasty nearly 300 years old. 
House Baratheon was born in the Wars of Conquest, when Aegon the Dragon invaded Westeros. Aegon sent his commander, Oris Baratheon, to take Storm's End. Argilac the Arrogant, the last of the Storm Kings, foolishly left the safety of his stronghold and met the Baratheon warlord in open battle. Argilac okay, was see. soundly defeated. So they didn't found the Storm King area, but they took it over, that makes sense. And his daughter. Oris was said to be a half-brother to Aegon Targaryen. Oh. If this were true, a little blood of the dragon mingled with that of the stag in those days. <laughs> the seat of House Baratheon is Storm's End, a legendary keep raised in the Age of Heroes. It overlooks Shipbreaker's Bay, where legend has it that Durin, the first Storm King, raised the keep with the aid of Bran the Builder of House Stark, forging a centuries-long connection with the Stormlands and the North. That's why their friendship is so After good Aegon's as well, you know. After conquest of the Seven background. Kingdoms, the Baratheons yeah. remained loyal enough to the Crown while Targaryen kings came and went. But loyalty has its limits. Yeah, I'm yep. sure it when does. When Rhaegar Targaryen, Eris's vile son and heir, adopted <laughs> Lyanna Stark. He hates her. Him. My beloved. It was I love the way he talks act. about her. We raised our banners. Baratheon, Stark, Jon Arryn and the Tullys. United in rebellion against Rhaegar and his father, the Mad King. We were victorious and took the Iron Throne. It's cool hearing about that their, their prime days, like Ned and Rob, they were just... Well, as it made me a they met tragic ends, the but in this period they were just of my long beasts. Lost ancestor, Oris. The truth of it is, I took it. I sit on the Iron Throne. <laughs> I rule the Seven Kingdoms from the Red Keep. Yeah, you do, Rob. But unfortunately, you've passed, not anymore. Oh, you gave it to your brat of a son who's not even your son. I know. One thing that I wanted to mention from the previous story was that, remember how Catelyn was talking to that guy to let them cross that river? He, he was saying, you know, we've been stuck in the middle of all your wars and things like that. Well, that's exactly where Rob's rebellion was. So I get why he was so hesitant initially and they had to promise the world to be able to let them cross. Yeah. The Sack of King's Landing by Mesa Lewin. Robert Baratheon's victory at the Trident was a turning point in the war for the Iron Throne. While it was clear the gods were smiling on the rebel forces, Aerys Targaryen still held the Red Keep at King's Landing. As Robert was wounded and unable to ride, it was up to Eddard Stark to make for the capital and force the Mad King to give up the throne. Lord Stark reached the city gates to find that Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, had already sacked the city in Robert's name. Damn. As Lannister had remained neutral up to this point, ignoring requests for help from both the Crown and the rebels. Yeah, interesting. Now More of their hatred. Was assured, I just played the winning it side. It seemed Lord Tywin had finally chosen a side. Lord Eddard was horrified by what he saw when he entered the city. Homes looted and burned, women raped, scores of innocent Damn. citizens v killed. Very Tywin. Disgusted, he led his force up Visenya's hill to the Red Keep. Upon entering the throne room, he found King Aerys lying in a pool of blood, dead by the hand of his own sworn king's guard, Jaime Lannister, who sat brazenly upon the throne. Ha ha ha. Demanding to know the whereabouts of Queen Rayla, Lord Eddard was informed the Queen and her son Viserys had been spirited away to Dragonstone before the Lannisters arrived. But other members of the royal family were not as fortunate. Elia um. Martell of Dawn, who was the wife of Prince Rhaegar, had been raped and murdered by Sir Krigor Clegane. Oh, shit. Orders. is that the hell? Sir Krigor and his man had also butchered mm, Rhaegar's no. children. When Robert was well enough to reach the capital, Lord Eddard demanded the Lannisters' answer for their heinous crimes. Robert refused, and sent him south to relieve the Baratheon stronghold of Storm's End, which was still under siege by forces loyal to the Crown. Whatever words passed between the two old friends are known only to them. 
but Lord Eddard is said to have left King's Landing in anger. Mm. Later, when Robert was crowned, he appointed John Arryn as Hand of the King. Lord Arryn's first order of business was to broker a truce with the Martells of Dawn, who were outraged by the brutal murder of Princess Elia and her children. Following the death of yeah. Lyanna Stark, who had been betrothed to Robert, Houses Baratheon and Lannister were joined in marriage when the new king took Tywin Lannister's eldest daughter Cersei as his queen. Big mistake, As dude. for Eddard Stark, he returned to his stronghold of Winterfell, forever haunted by his sister's death and the shameful way that Robert had secured his throne. Well, yeah. Yeah, that sucked. Imagine walking in and seeing Jaime just there, the person that, you know, I don't know, like, you saw someone, because Nettie's a person of honour and... Probably the most honourable that we've seen so far. Yeah, so to see that someone that was meant to protect the king, like, at all costs, was the one that stabbed him in the back, you can, you know that Ned is never going to appreciate that. He's never going to respect that. And I think that's where that friction between those families really does come from. And obviously because he married into the Lannisters to secure more power... The very family that he probably thought were the most dishonorable, even from being the hand of the previous, you know, the Mad King and everything. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a, it was a disaster. It was like playing the Game of Thrones, which Rob was more willing to do, but Ned's honor, from a more honorable standpoint, yeah, didn't like it. Yeah. The sack of King's Landing by Rob again, Robert. I want to hear from Daenerys, but I guess she was too, too young. young to say anything, yeah. yeah. For our rebellion to succeed, King's Landing had to be taken forcefully. No one was he talks with so much passion. to believe that Eris was going to hand his crown over peacefully. The Mad True. King's reign needed to end. What Tywin Lannister's forces did was unfortunate, but it was necessary to secure the Iron Throne and bring peace and justice to the Seven Kingdoms. Well, Rob didn't want peace, my he wanted war all the time. My victory at the Trident left me wounded. Loves it. But I sent my personal maester to attend to Sir Barristan Selmy instead. His wounds were more severe. Damn. Even though Sir Barristan was a member of Eris's King's Guard and fought on the opposing side, that man's bravery and loyalty was something to behold. He's very loyal. And this meant my wounds would take longer to heal and I couldn't ride to King's Landing myself. I sent the one man I trusted over anyone else in this world, Ned Stark. In man, my Ned. Place. Had I been able to ride, perhaps I could have reached King's Landing sooner and prevented some of the violence that occurred when the Lannisters... I think that's part of the city. shame that he's talking about. Still, what Lord Tywin did was for the greater good. Even what happened to Princess Elia and her children. Babies or no, theirs was the same cursed blood that flowed within the Mad King's veins. They were dragon spawn and couldn't be allowed to survive. Yeah. What would they grow to be? Loyal Rob's subjects. Rob's a lot more willing to do what needs to get done. with his damn northern honor. <laughs> he and I had our first major fight over the deaths of the Targaryen children. Yeah. Ned called it murder. Murder. It was war. <laughs> it was That's war. how he loves to say it. It's also a fair Lord point. Stark demanded that the Lannisters be held responsible for their crimes. Was it a crime to put an end to a family of lunatics born of incest? Mm, that's where I their differences and still are. still won't yeah. blame Tywin. Instead, I sent Ned Stark south to finish off the remaining Targaryen loyalists. It was only Lyanna Stark's death that reconciled us. Ned oh. had lost his sister. I had lost my betrothed and beloved. We shared that sad bond together, Ned and I. Through it, our friendship was made strong again. As for the Mad King's surviving heirs, those that were able to scurry away in the face of my fury now live somewhere across the narrow sea. They had best stay there. If they ever set foot in Westeros <laughs> again, they will face the King's justice. Oh, yeah, little do you know, though. little do you know. So their relationship was literally on thin ice and the death of Ned's sisters what brought them back together. I actually didn't know that. Yeah, well, they kind of, it makes sense now looking back on season one and, and 
even their first interaction, why it was a bit awkward kind of thing. It's probably been a long time. And it makes sense as well that Ned didn't really agree with the Lannister's treatment, not just the Kingslayer, because that he could probably look past, probably necessary, but it's more the, I don't reckon that was the bill end all for him, especially not, I don't even think he would have cared too much about that, given the Mad King was literally killing innocent people and there's no loyalty. Like Ned's not someone who would be loyal to somebody who's actually bad. I think it was more yeah. the rape and murder of all the civilians in, within this kingdom that's what would have pushed him over the line. I don't know. I feel like Ned would have still cared about that. They're still, it's still not honourable as someone that was meant to protect him. That I feel like Ned would have thought of other ways, you know. But yeah, not sure. Yeah, because Ned's main the, the argument he literally had over Rob was over the Lannisters. It wasn't over, and particularly over Tywin Lannisters being held responsible for the way they took the throne. So I think it was the overall brutality that he hated the most, but. Yeah, actually, no, I know it was. That, that's fact. No, because in the story previously, when I think it was Maester Lewin was talking, he literally said, you know, Rob walked in and saw Jamie Lannister there and blood all over the floor, that which was the Mad Kings. And they exchanged words. And from then on, they, they just didn't see eye to eye and they hated each other. So I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a dishonorable thing from that title's position. I'm just saying, I'm talking about Rob, talking about Ned. And I'm saying I don't that's think that's why Ned particularly hated it. I think that Ned's real issue was with the treatment of everyone. Sack of King's Landing by Tywin Lannister. Rhaegar Targaryen lay dead on the banks of the Trident. His royal army shattered and in retreat. The days of the Dragon Kings were clearly numbered. Until that moment, it would have been foolish to commit Casterly Rock to either the Crown or the Rebellion. It's very calculated. What would our family have to gain in supporting a raving madman? Or in entering a crusade to put Robert Baratheon on the Iron Throne? Huh. But chaos benefits no one. It was time for House Lannister to do what it could to ensure a return of peace and prosperity to the land. Okay, I don't mind that perspective, I, Tyron really. Lannister, brought 10,000 Lannister troops to the gates of King's Landing in order to bring the bloodshed to a quick and decisive conclusion. He's very King brutal Ares methods, had been but sending he to the point. for months, begging for my support to end the uprising. Imagine in that. Way, his pleas had been answered. As <laughs> I had suspected, Ares opened the city gates and welcomed my men. Right, damn. Our plan was clear. Crush Ares' remaining bannermen, and remove the remnants of the royal family as quickly and efficiently as possible. Any alternative meant years of further war and a fragmented seven kingdoms. Our I mean, means truth that too. were bloody, but the results speak for themselves. <laughs> as for Ares, it is true he met his fate at the hands of my son. Ares had kept Jamie it? close during the rebellion, thinking himself clever in keeping my son as a hostage, should I decide to pledge support to the rebel cause. This proved to be his greatest mistake. Greatest mistake. But when the time came, they had a man on the inside. Jamie did his duty as a Lannister and drove his sword into the Mad King's back. So he's proud. That, Robert Baratheon's crown was secured. The new king recognized our role in his ascension to the throne, mm. just as he recognized how useful the might and riches of Casterly Rock would be if he wanted to keep it. To that end, I offered my daughter Cersei as his queen. Had Ares and that was not bad decision. this same offer years earlier, perhaps things would have worked out differently. With Robert and Cersei crowned as king and queen of the Seven Kingdoms, it was a new day. The dragon was vanquished, and the Seven Kingdoms would thereafter belong to the stag and the lion. Mm, interesting. Very smart. Yeah, he's very calculated, isn't he? Like, he's very situational as well. Like, he just wants the winning side and what's best for his house alone, not so much the realm. It's Unless it's everyone peace. as well, but yeah. I, it does, it's very obvious as to why Ned lost the Battle of the Thrones or the Game of Thrones. Like, as much as I love his honourable character in this world setting, his idealism was sort of his downfall because everyone else was willing to get their hands a lot dirtier to do what needs to get done. Yeah. And you're just bound to get backstabbed at some point, which is what happened. Yeah. 
it's sad. It's sad seeing that you have to be so brutal just to like as a means of life in this universe, you know, but it's what has to get done. The Sack of King's Landing by Viserys Targaryen. Oh, here we go. The Battle of the Trident may have been an important victory for the usurper, but it was the treachery and barbarism of Tywin Lannister that sealed the fate of the Targaryen dynasty. My father, King Ares, had ever been a friend to the Lions of the Rock. Ares graciously brought Tywin to court, making him the youngest hand of the king in history. He gave him power. Didn't know that. He gave him respect. He made it possible for Tywin to restore House Lannister to glory. Ares and Tywin governed side by side for 20 prosperous years. Still, when the usurper called his banners in rebellion, Tywin Lannister ignored his king's pleas for help and stayed holed up in his stronghold of Casterly Rock. Because <laughs> it didn't in suit time, him. My brother, Prince Rhaegar, was dead. The realm was in turmoil, and the usurper's forces were said to be riding for King's Landing. Mm. What a glorious sight it must have been when a force of 10,000 Lannister men showed up at the gate of the capital with Lord Tywin at their head, pledging support to his beleaguered king. Ares opened the gates for his old friend. <laughs> Got screwed Instead, over big time. Lannister and his men proceeded to plunder and destroy the city that he had called home for death. Imagine that, he'd be celebrating like, thank you, and they've just As destroyed them. As the capital them. was ravaged and its people terrorized, I don't feel sorry for him Jamie at all after what he did to Ned's son of family. Lord Tywin proved every bit as treacherous. He killed my father, the king, at the foot of the Iron Throne. The Lannisters entered the Red Keep and Tywin ordered the deaths of the rest of the royal family. It is said Princess Rhaenys was found cowering under her father's bed and put to the sword. She was only a child. Brutal. Oh. As for Rhaegar's yeah, widow, brutal. Elia, she was forced to watch as Lannister thugs dashed her baby son's head against a wall oh, before shit. being raped and murdered herself. Wow, that's pretty brutal. As I was the heir to my father's throne, I had been spirited away to Dragonstone with my mother, Queen Rayla, who was with child. As a raging summer storm battered the island fortress and destroyed the Targaryen fleet as it lay at anchor, my sister Daenerys was born. Mm. My mother, the queen, died giving birth. Imagine Damn. that, man. Now, some yeah. 17 years later, the rightful king still lives in exile. The now dead. Reckoning is coming. I will sail west as Aegon yeah, the Dragon. Yeah, your ambition didn't go very well, brother. I will take back my But it lives on in Daenerys. Blood and fire. And I will punish the treacherous dogs who sought to destroy my family. And the people you ain't gonna punish them. shit. Potentially the last one, maybe not. Maybe there's one or two more, but House Aaron by Catelyn Stark. In the snow-capped mountains of the moon, standing high above the rich lands of the Vale, stands the Eyrie. A storied and impregnable fortress said to have been built by the legendary mountain kings in the Age of Heroes. It is the stronghold of House Aaron. One of the oldest noble families in Westeros. The oldest, Their sigil, yeah. A soaring falcon over a crescent moon. Their words, as high as honor. The Aarons are direct descendants of Andal invaders, who sailed across the narrow sea and came ashore at the Fingers. According to legend, Sir Artis Aaron, known as the Winged Knight, Soared through the sky atop a giant falcon, landing on right. the peak of the highest mountain where he defeated the Griffin King in battle. It was the Andal's first great victory over the first men, and Sir Artis was duly rewarded. He was declared King of the Mountain and the Vale, mm. and the region was renamed the Vale of Erin. Thousands oh. of years later, names. Aegon the Conqueror arrived in Westeros. <laughs> then it was Aaron bent the knee to Aegon and his dragons, and were allowed to maintain the control of the region, as Lords Paramount of the Vale and Wardens of the East. Over wow. the centuries, 
House Aaron remained loyal to the Targaryen dynasty until Lord John Aaron joined with houses Baratheon and Stark in rebellion yeah. against Mad King Aerys. So Aaron is where upon winning the Iron Throne, Tyrion was taken. Robert named Lord John Sky Souls, Hand yeah. of the King, a position he held until his mysterious death. So that was the veil. Oh no, I'm saying the yeah. veil is that Sky yeah, Tower. Yeah, Sky Souls, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's actually interesting that Aaron was literally part of like the the Andals. Um descendants, yeah. Yeah. And then he was the first one to go against the Targaryens. And critical move. He had more balls than Tywin because he just made a decision when it wasn't guaranteed. I know. And then really that was his downfall for him because then Rob was king, married Cersei, and let's be fair, I'm pretty sure Cersei killed him for yeah. knowing what that she had that, you know, that Joffrey we just need was to find out who. I wonder if it is Cersei or if it's even another mystery. That would be interesting to find out. No, nah, it's Cersei. Cersei was covering up that Joffrey was Jamie's yeah, son. Yeah, well, that's the obvious one. I just wonder if they went one step further and made it even more secret. We'll find out. How's Here we go. Star by Tywin himself. This is going to be like a proud coast one. Of the continent, high atop a rocky promontory overlooking the Sunset Sea, sits Casterly Rock, ancestral seat of House Lannister. Below it lies Lannisport, one of the great cities of Westeros, a center for trade, culture, and the great Lannister fleet. There are a number of gold and silver mines in the Westerlands, making it the richest region in all yep. of Westeros. Yeah, okay. That, that makes sense. One of the most productive mines lies beneath Casterly Rock itself, making House Lannister the wealthiest of all the noble houses. This allows House Lannister to finance many endeavors of other noble houses. Even the king himself has sought credit from Casterly Rock from time to time. And don't we know it? We Lannisters claim our descent from the Andal invaders and through the female Them as well. Lan the Clever. According to the legend, Interesting. Lan, using only his wits, won Casterly Rock from the noble house of Casterly during the Age of Heroes. So the Lannisters Heroes reigned as whole, kings uh, of the rock for thousands of itself, years. Wow and worked to make it the envy of the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. Our time as kings ended, however, when Aegon Targaryen, otherwise known as Aegon the Conqueror, Aegon arrived shifted the in whole history. I know. The last king of the rock, King Lorin Lannister, joined forces with King Myrne Gardner, the king of the Reach. Together with 60,000 men, they met the Targaryen host in open battle. History tells us that Aegon unleashed all three of his dragons, slaughtering 4,000 men at what came to be known as the Field of Fire. That's so crazy King still. Yeah. himself yeah. was burned alive that day, and House Gardner turned to ash with him. Damn. Seeing both the threat and opportunity the Targaryens represented, Lorin wisely surrendered and aided Aegon in his further conquest of Westeros. The Lannisters were thus appointed Lords Paramount of the Westerlands and Wardens of the West, titles we hold to this day. Let us yeah. be clear, though. It is neither luck nor royal favor that makes our house <laughs> prosperous. Is the big statement. There have been times in our history where some have thought us weak, lazy or opulent really my father titus lannister nearly bankrupted our house with his poor investments <laughs> and allowed himself to be mocked openly at court when our vassal the reigns of castamere dared to rise up against the lannisters they learned how dangerous it can be to taunt a lion <laughs> i tywin lannister Fair led enough. the assault on castamere to put down this rebellion I made an example of them to anyone who doubts wow. our might. They even made a quaint song about the fates of the reigns of Castamere. Sadly, there are no reigns left to hear it. Today, the Golden Lion of Lannister is rightly admired and feared throughout the Seven Kingdoms. Our and he words loves that. Are, Hear me roar. House words. But there are yep. other words that should be remembered when crossing a lion of Casterly Rock. Let's hear him. 
A Lannister always pays his debts. That's the one. The infamous. Yep. Interesting. There's so much, like, pride. Even though, like, before him, there wasn't a lot to be proud of. He made sure that name was going to be one to remember. And, and that feared. makes sense to why he holds Jamie in such high regard, because he literally turned the tides for the whole family. Yeah. Jamie hasn't yet seized that level of glory for the family and taken it to that next level, which is what he wants. Yeah. And it, it's always that, you know, the children always living in the shadow of their parents. You know, it's like, I did this, so you need to be better. And that's quite crippling. Okay, let's hear about how Stark. By Bran and Rob, the brothers, to finish us off. The Starks of Winterfell trace their descent to the first men in the Age of Heroes. The family's founder was Brandon the Builder, who, in the aftermath of the Long Night, helped establish the Night's Watch. Legend has it he enlisted the aid of giants and the powerful magic of the children. I really of the want to see the giants. Raised the mighty yeah. Bull, which has protected the realm for generations. He went on to build the ancestral seat of Winterfell and reigned as the first king in the north. The Starks reigned as kings for thousands of years, even withstanding the invasion of the Andals. As the southern kingdoms fell and the children of the forest were driven away, the north stood strong maintaining its religious customs and its way of life. Eventually, the reign of the Kings of Winter came to an end with the coming of Aegon the Conqueror. Damn oh, Aegon. 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 Aegon! And his dragons destroyed the combined armies of the Reach and the Rock at the Field of Fire. King Torrhen Stark bent the knee and swore fealty to the Targaryen dynasty in order to spare the destruction of Winterfell and his people. He was yeah. forever after known as the King Who Knelt. Yeah. As a reward for his submission, Aegon named Torrhen Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. The Starks mm. take great pride in their history and traditions. So they're so all very honourable, noble, noble people. Houses that still keeps the old gods. A sacred weirwood tree looms large in Winterfell's godswood. Its ancestral sword, ice, was forged in ancient Valeria and has been passed down through the generations. How Stark remained steadfast in its support of the Night's Watch, even as the once yeah. illustrious order has fallen on hard times. True. Much yeah. like their sigil, the Grey Direwolf, How Stark is the stuff of legend in the North and throughout the Seven Kingdoms. And their family words, Winter is coming. It's so famous famous Winter words. is coming. In the wake of the long night, and a grim portent of things to come. Oh. Definitely things to come. Damn. Damn. Um, in over my head by miles. <laughs> Although the repetition definitely helped. Yeah. Hearing it again and again, you could grasp a lot more. That demanded a lot of focus, like a lot more focus than usual. So I'm definitely going to be lying down after this one and, and recouping a little bit. <laughs> but I definitely do feel like I've got a better grasp on the world and season and the season now. So, yeah, I feel like it'll help with the familiarity of season two, especially just having more background behind everyone. It gives more meaning to the characters when we do see them reappear, especially characters like Tywin, who I haven't seen much from, and even Mace Luwin, who I sort of had dismissed, but now they've all got this, you know, more meaning behind them, knowing what they've been through and what they've done. Yeah, but even, like, not even as individuals themselves, but as... Houses. Yeah, but, like, the way they interact with each person, there's history there, and then you really understand why they're reacting in that way, um, why they have certain feelings towards, like, other characters. Yeah. But it is... This was so interesting, the way they did it. Like, especially the same story from different people's perspectives. And it's a testament to ha the writing of Game of, Thro Game of Thrones and its universe because you really get to see other... Like, everyone's perspective and you kind of feel like a lot of the time that it's justified. Even if you prefer someone else's reasoning and whatnot, you can still have sympathy or really come to understand the other side of the coin. Yeah, Game of Thrones does that really well. We've seen it, especially in House of the Dragons, where there's a very gray area you, where both sides have right and wrong to what they've done and you can understand the motives of both sides and it does, it does well bringing both perspectives to the table so for sure this did that as well well guys that's our reaction to this history of law that was a lot of law definitely yeah. gonna take time to digest that as well and might have to watch it again yeah it was a lot of information but it will help us understand the world a little bit better 
We hope you enjoyed our reaction to this. Let us know in the comments down below if we got anything wrong or got lost and you can fill us in. I'm sure we did. <laughs> yep. And we look forward to seeing you guys on season two of Game of Thrones. Until then, take care of yourselves and we'll see you next time. See you guys.